since there was neither wound nor marks of strangulation. But on the other hand, whose blood was that which lay so thickly upon the floor? There were no signs of a struggle, nor had the victim any weapon with which he might have wounded an antagonist. As long as all these questions were unsolved, I felt that sleep would be no easy matter, either for Holmes or myself. His quiet, self-confident manner convinced me that he had already formed a theory which explained all the facts, though what it was I could not for an instant conjecture. He was very late in returning, so late that I knew that the concert could not have detained him all the time. Dinner was on the table before he appeared. "'It was magnificent,' he said as he took his seat. "'Do you remember what Darwin says about music?' He claims that the power of producing and appreciating it existed among the human race long before the power of speech was arrived at. Perhaps that is why we are so subtly influenced by it. There are vague memories in our souls of those misty centuries when the world was in its childhood. That's rather a broad idea, I remarked. One's ideas must be as broad as nature if they are to interpret nature, he answered. What's the matter? You're not looking quite yourself. This Brixton Road affair has upset you. To tell the truth, it has, I said. I ought to be more case-hardened after my Afghan experiences. I saw my own comrades hacked to pieces at my wand without losing my nerve. I can understand. There is a mystery about this which stimulates the imagination. Where there is no imagination, there is no horror. Have you seen the evening paper? No. It gives a fairly good account of the affair. It does not mention the fact that when the man was raised up, a woman's wedding ring fell upon the floor. It is just as well it does not. Why? Look at this advertisement, he answered. I had one sent to every paper this morning, immediately after the affair. He threw the paper across to me, and I glanced at the place indicated. It was the first announcement in the found column. In Brixton Road this morning, it ran, a plain gold wedding ring found in the roadway between the White Hart Tavern and Holland Grove. Apply Dr. Watson, 221B Baker Street, between 8 and 9 this evening. Excuse my using your name, he said. If I use my own, some of these dunderheads would recognize it and want to meddle in the affair. Now oh, that's all right, I answered. But supposing anyone applies, I have no ring. "'Oh, yes, you have,' said he, handing me one. "'This will do very well. It is almost a facsimile. "'And who do you expect will answer this advertisement?' "'Why, the man in the brown coat, our florid friend with the square toes. "'If he does not come himself, he will send an accomplice. "'Would he not consider it as too dangerous?' "'Not at all. If my view of the case is correct, "'and I have every reason to believe that it is, this man would rather risk anything than lose the ring. According to my notion, he dropped it while stooping over Drebber's body, and did not miss it at the time. After leaving the house, he discovered his loss and hurried back, but found the police already in possession, owing to his own folly in leaving the candle burning. He had to pretend to be drunk in order to allay the suspicions which might have been aroused by his appearance at the gate. Now, put yourself in that man's place. On thinking the matter over, it must have occurred to him that it was possible that he had lost the ring in the road after leaving the house. What would he do then? He would eagerly look out for the evening papers in the hope of seeing it among the articles found. His eye, of course, would light upon this. He would be overjoyed. Why should he fear a trap? There would be no reason in his eyes why the finding of the ring should be connected with the murder. He would come. He will come. You shall see him within an hour. And then? I asked. Oh, you can leave me to deal with him then. Have you any arms? I have my old service revolver and a few cartridges. You had better clean it and load it. He will be a desperate man, and though I shall take him unawares, it is as well to be ready for anything. I went to my bedroom and followed his advice. When I returned with the pistol, the table had been cleared, and Holmes was engaged in his favourite occupation of scraping upon his violin. "'The plot thickens,' he said as I entered. 
I have just had an answer to my American telegram. My view of the case is the correct one. And that is? I asked eagerly. My fiddle would be the better for new strings, he remarked. Put your pistol in your pocket. When the fellow comes, speak to him in an ordinary way. Leave the rest to me. Don't frighten him by looking at him too hard. It is eight o'clock now, I said, glancing at my watch. Yes, he will probably be here in a few minutes. Open the door slightly. That will do. Now put the key on the inside. Thank you. This is a queer old book I picked up at a stall yesterday. De Jure Intergentes, published in Latin at Liège in the Lowlands in 1642. Charles' head was still firm on his shoulders when this little brown-backed volume was struck off. Who is the printer? Philippe de Croix, whoever he may have been. On the fly-leaf, in very faded ink, is written Ex Libris Giliomli White. I wonder who William White was. Some pragmatical seventeenth-century lawyer, I suppose. His writing has a legal twist about it. Here comes our man, I think. As he spoke, there was a sharp ring at the bell. Sherlock Holmes rose softly and moved his chair in the direction of the door. We heard the servant pass along the hall, and the sharp click of the latch as she opened it. "'Does Dr. Watson live here?' asked a clear but rather harsh voice. We could not hear the servant's reply, but the door closed, and someone began to ascend the stairs. The footfall was an uncertain and shuffling one. A look of surprise passed over the face of my companion as he listened to it. It came slowly along the passage, and there was a feeble tap at the door. "'Come in!' I cried. At my summons, instead of the man of violence whom we expected, a very old and wrinkled woman hobbled into the apartment. She appeared to be dazzled by the sudden blaze of light, and after dropping a curtsy, she stood blinking at us with her bleared eyes and fumbling in her pocket with nervous, shaky fingers. I glanced at my companion, and his face had assumed such a disconsolate expression that it was all I could do to keep my countenance. The old crone drew out an evening paper and pointed at our advertisement. "'It's this as has brought me, good gentleman,' she said, dropping another curtsy. "'A gold wedding ring in the Brixton Road. "'It belongs to my girl Sally, as was married only this time twelve month, "'which her husband is steward aboard a union boat, "'and what he'd say if he come home and found her without her ring "'is more than I can think, he being short enough at the best of times, "'but more especially when he has the drink.' "'If it please you, she went to the circus last night along with—' "'Is that her ring?' I asked. "'The Lord be thanked!' cried the old woman. "'Sally will be a glad woman this night. That's the ring!' "'And what may your address be?' I inquired, taking up a pencil. Thirteen Duncan Street, Hounds Ditch. A weary way from here.' "'The Brixton Road does not lie between any circus and hound's ditch,' said Sherlock Holmes sharply. The old woman faced round and looked keenly at him from her little red-rimmed eyes. "'The gentleman asked me for my address,' she said. "'Sally lives in lodgings at Three Mayfield Place, Peckham.' "'And your name is?' "'My name is Sawyer. Hers is Dennis, which... "'Tom Dennis married her, and a smart, clean lad, too, "'as long as he's at sea, and no steward in the company more thought of. "'But when on shore, what with the women, and what with liquor shops—' "'Here is your ring, Mrs. Sawyer,' I interrupted in obedience to a sign from my companion. "'It clearly belongs to your daughter, and I am glad to be able to restore it to the rightful owner.' "'With many mumbled blessings and protestations of gratitude, the old crone packed it away in her pocket and shuffled off down the stairs. Sherlock Holmes sprang to his feet the moment that she was gone and rushed into his room. He returned in a few seconds, enveloped in an ulster and a cravat. "'I'll follow her,' he said hurriedly. "'She must be an accomplice and will lead me to him. Wait up for me.' The hall door had hardly slammed behind our visitor before Holmes had descended the stair. 
looking through the window, I could see her walking feebly along the other side, while her pursuer dogged her some little distance behind. Either this whole theory is incorrect, I thought to myself, or else it would be led down to the heart of the mystery. There was no need for him to ask me to wait up for him, for I felt that sleep was impossible until I heard the result of his adventure. It was close upon nine when he set out. I had no idea how long he might be, but I sat stolidly puffing at my pipe and skipping over the pages of Henri Murger's Vie de Bohème. Ten o'clock passed, and I heard the footsteps of the maid as they pattered off to bed. Eleven, and the more stately tread of the landlady passed my door, bound for the same destination. It was close upon twelve before I heard the sharp sound of his latch-key. The instant he entered, I saw by his face that he had not been successful. Amusement and chagrin seemed to be struggling for the mastery, until the former suddenly carried the day, and he burst into a hearty laugh. "'I wouldn't have the Scotland Yarders know it for the world,' he cried, dropping into his chair. "'I have chafed them so much that they would never have let me hear the end of it. I can afford to laugh because I know that I'll be even with them in the long run.' "'What is it, then?' I asked. "'Oh, I don't mind telling a story against myself. "'That creature had gone a little way "'when she began to limp and show every sign of being footsore. "'Presently she came to a halt and hailed a four-wheeler which was passing. "'I managed to be close to her so as to hear the address, "'but I need not have been so anxious, "'for she sang it out loud enough to be heard at the other side of the street. "'Drive to 13 Duncan Street, Hounds Ditch!' she cried. This begins to look genuine, I thought, and having seen her safely inside, I perched myself behind. That's an art which every detective should be an expert at. Well, away we rattled, and never drew rein until we reached the street in question. I hopped off before we came to the door, and strolled down the street in an easy lounging way. I saw the cab pull up. The driver jumped down, and I saw him open the door and stand expectantly. Nothing came out. When I reached him, he was groping about frantically in the empty cab, and giving vent to the finest assorted collection of oaths that ever I listened to. There was no sign or trace of his passenger, and I fear it will be some time before he gets his fare. On inquiring at number 13, we found that the house belonged to a respectable paper-hanger named Keswick, and that no one of the name either of Sawyer or Dennis had ever been heard of there. "'You don't mean to say—' I cried in amazement, that that tottering, feeble old woman was able to get out of the cab while it was in motion without either you or the driver seeing her. "'Old woman be damned,' said Sherlock Holmes sharply. "'We were the old women, were so taken in. It must have been a young man, and an active one too, besides being an incomparable actor. The get-up was inimitable. He saw that he was followed, no doubt, and used this means of giving me the slip.' It shows that the man we are after is not as lonely as I imagined he was, but has friends who are ready to risk something for him. Now, Doctor, you're looking done up. Take my advice and turn in. I was certainly feeling very weary, so I obeyed his injunction. I left home seated in front of the smouldering fire, and long into the watches of the night I heard the low, melancholy wailings of his violin and knew that he was still pondering over the strange problem which he had set himself to unravel. End of chapter 5
the socialists had many branches in america and the deceased had no doubt infringed their unwritten laws and been tracked down by them after alluding airily to the Wemgericht aquatofana cabanari the marchioness de brinvilliers the darwinian theory the principles of malthus and the ratcliffe highway murders the article concluded by admonishing the government and advocating a closer watch over foreigners in england the standard commented upon the fact that lawless outrages of the sort usually occurred under a liberal administration they arose from the unsettling of the minds of the masses and the consequent weakening of all authority the deceased was an american gentleman who had been residing for some weeks in the metropolis he had stayed at the boarding house of madame charpentier in torquay terrace camberwell he was accompanied in his travels by his private secretary mr joseph stangerson the two bade adieu to their landlady upon tuesday the fourth inst and departed to euston station with the avowed intention of catching the liverpool express they were afterwards seen together upon the platform nothing more is known of them until mr drebber's body was as recorded discovered in an empty house in the brixton road many miles from euston how he came there or how he met his fate are questions which are still involved in mystery nothing is known of the whereabouts of stangerson we are glad to learn that mr lestrade and mr gregson of scotland yard are both engaged upon the case and it is confidentially anticipated that these well-known officers will speedily throw light upon the matter the daily news observed that there was no doubt as to the crime being a political one the despotism and hatred of liberalism which animated the continental governments had had the effect of driving to our shores a number of men who might have made excellent citizens were they not soured by the recollection of all that they had undergone among these men there was a stringent code of honor any infringement of which was punished by death every effort should be made to find the secretary stangerson and to ascertain some particulars of the habits of the deceased a great step had been gained by the discovery of the address of the house at which he had boarded a result which was entirely due to the acuteness and energy of mr gregson of scotland yard sherlock holmes and i read these notices over together at breakfast and they appeared to afford him considerable amusement i told you that whatever happened lestrade and gregson would be sure to score that depends on how it turns out oh bless you it doesn't matter in the least if the man is caught it will be on account of their exertions if he escapes it will be in spite of their exertions it's heads i win and tails you lose whatever they do they will have followers and so trouve toujours un plus so qu'il admire what on earth is this i cried for at this moment there came the pattering of many steps in the hall and on the stairs accompanied by audible expressions of disgust upon the part of our landlady it's the baker street division of the detective police force said my companion gravely and as he spoke there rushed into the room half a dozen of the dirtiest and most ragged street arabs that ever i clapped eyes on tension cried holmes in a sharp tone and the six dirty little scoundrels stood in a line like so many disreputable statuettes in future you shall send up wiggins alone to report and the rest of you must wait in the street have you found it wiggins no sir we hain't said one of the youths i hardly expected you would you must keep on until you do here are your wages he handed each of them a shilling now off you go and come back with a better report next time he waved his hand and they scampered away downstairs like so many rats and we heard their shrill voices next moment in the street there's more work to be got out of one of those little beggars than out of a dozen of the force holmes remarked the mere sight of an official-looking person seals men's lips these youngsters however go everywhere and hear everything they are as sharp as needles too all they want is organization is it on this brixton case that you're employing them i asked yes there is a point which i wish to ascertain it is merely a matter of time hello we're going to hear some news now with a vengeance 
here is gregson coming down the road with beatitude written upon every feature of his face bound for us i know yes he is stopping there he is there was a violent peal at the bell and in a few seconds the fair-haired detective came up the stairs three steps at a time and burst into our sitting-room my dear fellow he cried wringing holmes unresponsive hand congratulate me i have made the whole thing as clear as day a shade of anxiety seemed to me to cross my companion's expressive face do you mean that you are on the right track he asked the right track why sir we have the man under lock and key and his name is arthur charpentier sub-lieutenant in her majesty's navy cried gregson pompously rubbing his fat hands and inflating his chest sherlock holmes gave a sigh of relief and relaxed into a smile take a seat and try one of these cigars he said we are anxious to know how you managed it will you have some whisky and water i don't mind if i do the detective answered the tremendous exertions which i have gone through during the last day or two have worn me out not so much bodily exertion you understand as the strain upon the mind you will appreciate that mr sherlock holmes for we are both brain workers you do me too much honour said holmes gravely let us hear how you arrived at this most gratifying result the detective seated himself in the armchair and puffed complacently at his cigar then suddenly he slapped his thigh in a paroxysm of amusement <laughs> the fun of it is he cried that that fool lestrade who thinks himself so smart has gone off upon the wrong track altogether he's after the secretary stangerson who had no more to do with the crime than the babe unborn i have no doubt that he has caught him by this time the idea tickled gregson so much that he laughed until he choked and how did you get your clue <laughs> i'll tell you about it of course dr watson this is strictly between ourselves the first difficulty which we had to contend with was the finding of this american's antecedents some people would have waited until their advertisements were answered or until parties came forward and volunteered information that is not tobias gregson's way of going to work you remember the hat beside the dead man yes said holmes by john underwood and sons 129 camberwell road gregson looked quite crestfallen i had no idea that you noticed that he said have you been there no ha cried gregson in a relieved voice you should never neglect a chance however small it may seem to a great mind nothing is little remarked holmes sententiously well i went to underwood and asked him if he had sold a hat of that size and description he looked over his books and came on it at once he had sent the hat to a mr drebber residing at charpentier's boarding establishment torquay terrace thus i got at his address smart very smart murmured sherlock holmes i next called upon madame charpentier continued the detective i found her very pale and distressed her daughter was in the room an uncommonly fine girl she is too she was looking red about the eyes and her lips trembled as i spoke to her that didn't escape my notice i began to smell a rat you know the feeling mr sherlock holmes when you come upon the right scent a kind of thrill in your nerves have you heard of the mysterious death of your late boarder mr enoch j drebber of cleveland i asked the mother nodded she didn't seem able to get out a word the daughter burst into tears i felt more than ever that these people knew something of the matter at what o'clock did dr drebber leave your house for the train i asked at eight o'clock she said gulping in her throat to keep down her agitation his secretary mr stangerson said that there were two trains one at nine fifteen and one at eleven he was to catch the first and was that the last which you saw of him a terrible change came over the woman's face as i asked the question 
her features turned perfectly livid it was some seconds before she could get out the single word yes and when it did come it was in a husky unnatural tone there was silence for a moment and when the daughter spoke in a calm clear voice no good can ever come of falsehood mother she said let us be frank with this gentleman we did see mr drebber again god forgive you cried madame charpentier throwing up her hands and sinking back in her chair you have murdered your brother arthur would rather that we spoke the truth the girl answered firmly you had best tell me all about it now i said off confidences are worse than none besides you do not know how much we know of it on your head be it alice cried her mother and then turning to me i will tell you all sir do not imagine that my agitation on behalf of my son arises from any fear lest he should have had a hand in this terrible affair he is utterly innocent of it my dread is however that in your eyes and in the eyes of others he may appear to be compromised that however is surely impossible his eye character his profession his antecedents would all forbid it your best way is to make a clean breast of the facts i answered depend upon it if your son is innocent he will be none the worse perhaps alice you had better leave us together she said and her daughter withdrew now sir she continued i had no intention of telling you all this but since my poor daughter has disclosed it i have no alternative having once decided to speak i will tell you all without omitting any particular it is your wisest course said i mr drebber has been with us nearly three weeks he and his secretary mr stangerson have been travelling on the continent i noticed a copenhagen label upon each of their trunks showing that that had been their last stopping place stangerson was a quiet reserved man but his employer i am sorry to say was far otherwise he was coarse in his habits and brutish in his ways the very night of his arrival he became very much the worse for drink and indeed after twelve o'clock in the day he could hardly ever be said to be sober his manners towards the maid-servants were disgustingly free and familiar worst of all he speedily assumed the same attitude towards my daughter alice and spoke to her more than once in a way which fortunately she is too innocent to understand on one occasion he actually seized her in his arms and embraced her an outrage which caused his own secretary to reproach him for his unmanly conduct but why did you stand all this i asked i suppose that you can get rid of your boarders when you wish mrs charpentier blushed at my pertinent question would to god that i had given him notice on the very day that he came she said but it was a sore temptation they were paying a pound a day each fourteen pounds a week and this is a slack season i am a widow and my boy in the navy has cost me much i grudge to lose the money i acted for the best this last was too much however and i gave him notice to leave on account of it that was the reason of his going well my heart grew light when i saw him drive away my son is on leave just now but i did not tell him anything of all this for his temper is violent and he is passionately fond of his sister when i closed the door behind him a load seemed to be lifted from my mind alas in less than an hour there was a ring at the bell and i learned that mr drebber had returned he was much excited and evidently the worse for drink he forced his way into the room where i was sitting with my daughter and made some incoherent remark about having missed his train he then turned to alice and before my very face proposed to her that she should fly with him you are of age he said and there is no law to stop you i have money enough and to spare never mind the old girl here but come along with me now straight away you shall live like a princess poor alice was so frightened that she shrunk away from him but he caught her by the wrist and endeavoured to draw her towards the door i screamed and at that moment my son arthur came into the room what happened then i do not know i heard oaths and the confused sounds of a scuffle i was too terrified to raise my head 
when i did look up i saw arthur standing in the doorway laughing with a stick in his hand i don't think that fine fellow will trouble us again he said i'll just go after him and see what he does with himself with those words he took his hat and started off down the street the next morning we heard of mr drebber's mysterious death this statement came from Mrs. Charpentier's lips with many gasps and pauses. At times she spoke so low that I could hardly catch the words. I made shorthand notes of all that she said, however, so that there should be no possibility of a mistake. "'It's quite exciting,' said Sherlock Holmes with a yawn. "'What happened next?' "'When Mrs. Charpentier paused,' the detective continued, "'I saw that the whole case hung up on one point fixing her with my eye in a way which i always found effective with women i asked her at what hour her son returned i do not know she answered not know no he has a latch key and he let himself in after you went to bed yes when did you go to bed about eleven so your son was gone at least two hours yes possibly four or five yes what was he doing during that time i do not know she answered turning white to her very lips of course after that there was nothing more to be done i found out where lieutenant charpentier was took two officers with me and arrested him when i touched him on the shoulder and warned him to come quietly with us he answered us as bold as brass i suppose you're arresting me for being concerned in the death of that scoundrel drebber he said we had said nothing to him about it, so that his alluding to it had a most suspicious aspect. Very, said Holmes. He still carried the heavy stick which the mother prescribed as having with him when he followed Drebber. It was a stout oak cudgel. Um, what is your theory then? Well, my theory is that he followed Drebber as far as the Brixton Road when there a fresh altercation arose between them in the course of which drebber received a blow from the stick in the pit of the stomach perhaps which killed him without leaving any mark the night was so wet that no one was about so charpentier dragged the body of his victim into the empty house as to the candle and the blood and the writing on the wall and the ring they may all be so many tricks to throw the police onto the wrong scent well done said holmes in an encouraging voice really gregson you are getting along we shall make something of you yet i flatter myself that i have managed it rather neatly the detective answered proudly the young man volunteered a statement in which he said that after following drebber some time the latter perceived him and took a cab in order to get away from him on his way home he met an old shipmate and took a long walk with him on being asked where this old shipmate lived he was unable to give any satisfactory reply i think the old case fits together uncommonly well what amuses me is to think of lestrade who started off on the wrong scent i'm afraid he won't make much of why by jove he's the very man himself it was indeed lestrade who had ascended the stairs while we were talking and who now entered the room the assurance and jauntiness which generally marked his demeanour and dress were however wanting his face was disturbed and troubled while his clothes were disarranged and untidy he had evidently come with the intention of consulting with sherlock holmes for on perceiving his colleague he appeared to be embarrassed and put out he stood in the centre of the room fumbling nervously with his hat and uncertain what to do this is a most extraordinary case he said at last a most incomprehensible affair ah oh, you find it so mr lestrade cried gregson triumphantly oh, i thought you would come to that conclusion have you managed to find the secretary mr joseph stangerson the secretary mr joseph stangerson said lestrade gravely was murdered at alliday's private hotel about six o'clock this morning. End of chapter six.
Chapter 7. Light in the Darkness The intelligence with which Lestrade greeted us was so momentous, and so unexpected, that we were all three fairly dumbfounded. Gregson sprang out of his chair, and upset the remainder of his whisky and water. I stared in silence at Sherlock Holmes, whose lips were compressed, and his brows drawn down over his eyes. "'Stangerson, too,' he muttered. "'The plot thickens.' "'It was quite thick enough before,' grumbled Lestrade, taking a chair. "'I seem to have dropped into a sort of council of war.' "'Are you, are you sure of this piece of intelligence?' stammered Gregson. "'I've just come from his room,' said Lestrade. "'I was the first to discover what had occurred.' "'We have been hearing Gregson's view of the matter,' Holmes observed. "'Would you mind letting us know what you have seen and done?' "'I have no objection,' Lestrade answered, seating himself. "'I freely confess that I was of the opinion that Stangerson was concerned in the death of Drebber. "'This fresh development has shown me that I was completely mistaken. "'Full of the one idea, I set myself to find out what had become of the secretary.' They had been seen together at Euston Station about half-past eight on the evening of the third. At two in the morning, Drebber had been found in the Brixton Road. The question which confronted me was to find out how Stangerson had been employed between 8.30 and the time of the crime, and what had become of him afterwards. I telegraphed to Liverpool, giving a description of the man, and warning them to keep a watch upon the American boats. I then set to work, calling upon all the hotels and lodging-houses in the vicinity of Euston. You see, I argued that if Drebber and his companion had become separated, the natural course for the latter would be to put up somewhere in the vicinity for the night, and then to hang about the station again next morning. "'They would be likely to agree on some meeting-place beforehand,' remarked Holmes. "'So it proved. I spent the whole of yesterday evening in making inquiries entirely without avail. This morning I began very early, and at eight o'clock I reached Halliday's private hotel in Little George Street. On my inquiry as to whether a Mr. Stangerson was living there, they at once answered me in the affirmative. "'No doubt you are the gentleman whom he was expecting,' they said. "'He has been waiting for a gentleman for two days.' "'Where is he now?' I asked." "'He's upstairs in bed. He wishes to be called at nine. "'I will go up and see him at once,' I said. "'It seemed to me that my sudden appearance might shake his nerves "'and lead him to say something unguarded. "'The boots volunteered to show me the room. "'It was on the second floor, and there was a small corridor leading up to it. "'The boots pointed out the door to me, "'and was about to go downstairs again when I saw something that made me feel sickish.' in spite of my twenty years experience from under the door there curled a little red ribbon of blood which had meandered across the passage and formed a little pool along the skirting at the other side i gave a cry which brought the boots back he nearly fainted when he saw it the door was locked on the inside but we put our shoulders to it and knocked it in the window of the room was open and beside the window, all huddled up, lay in the body of a man in his nightdress. He was quite dead, and had been for some time, for his limbs were rigid and cold. When we turned him over, the boots recognised him at once as being the same gentleman who had engaged the room under the name of Joseph Stangerson. The cause of death was a deep stab in the left side, which must have penetrated the heart. And now comes the strangest part of the affair. "'What do you suppose was above the murdered man?' "'I felt a creeping of the flesh "'and a presentiment of coming horror, "'even before Sherlock Holmes answered. "'The word Rache, written in letters of blood,' he said. "'That was it,' said Lestrade in an awestruck voice, "'and we were all silent for a while. "'There was something so methodical and so incomprehensible "'about the deeds of this unknown assassin,' that it imparted a fresh ghastliness to his crimes. My nerves, which were steady enough on the field of battle, tingled as I thought of it. "'The man was seen,' said Lestrade, 
a milk boy passing on his way to the dairy happened to walk down the lane which leads from the mews at the back of the hotel he noticed that a ladder which usually lay there was raised against one of the windows of the second floor which was wide open after passing he looked back and saw a man descend the ladder he came down so quietly and openly that the boy imagined him to be some carpenter or joiner at work in the hotel he took no particular notice of him beyond thinking in his own mind that it was early for him to be at work he has an impression that the man was tall had a reddish face and was dressed in a long brownish coat he must have stayed in the room some little time after the murder for we found blood-stained water in the basin where he'd washed his hands and marks on the sheets where he deliberately wiped his knife i glanced at holmes on hearing the description of the murderer which tallied so exactly with his own there was however no trace of exultation or satisfaction upon his face did you find nothing in the room which could furnish a clue to the murderer he asked nothing stangerson had drebber's purse in his pocket but it seems that this was usual as he did all the paying there was eighty odd pounds in it but nothing had been taken whatever the motives of these extraordinary crimes robbery is certainly not one of them there were no papers or memoranda in the murdered man's pocket except a single telegram dated from cleveland about a month ago and containing the words j h is in europe there was no name appended to the message and there was nothing else holmes asked nothing of importance the man's novel with which he had read himself to sleep was lying upon the bed and his pipe was on a chair beside him there was a glass of water on the table and on the window sill a small chip ointment box containing a couple of pills sherlock holmes sprang from his chair with an exclamation of delight the last link he cried exultantly my case is complete the two detectives stared at him in amazement i have now in my hands my companion said confidently all the threads which have formed such a tangle there are of course details to be filled in but i am as certain of all the main facts from the time that drebus parted from stangerson at the station up to the discovery of the body of the latter as if i had seen them with my own eyes i will give you a proof of my knowledge could you lay your hand upon those pills i have them said lestrade producing a small white box i took em and the purse and the telegram intending to have them put in a place of safety at the police station it was the merest chance my taking those pills for i am bound to say that i do not attach any importance to them I give them here said holmes now doctor turning to me are those ordinary pills they certainly were not they were of a pearly gray color small round and almost transparent against the light from their lightness and transparency i should imagine that they're soluble in water i remarked precisely so answered holmes now would you mind going down and fetching that poor little devil of a terrier which has been bad so long and which the landlady wanted you to put out of its pain yesterday i went downstairs and carried the dog upstairs in my arms its labored breathing and glazing eye showed that it was not far from its end indeed its snow-white muzzle proclaimed that it had already exceeded the usual term of canine existence i placed it upon a cushion on the rug i will now cut one of these pills in two said holmes and drawing his penknife he suited the action to the word one half we return into the box for future purposes the other half i will place in this wine glass in which is a teaspoonful of water you perceive that our friend the doctor is right and that it readily dissolves this may be very interesting said lestrade in the injured tone of one who suspects that he is being laughed at i cannot see however what it has to do with the death of mr joseph stangerson patience my friend patience you will find in time that it has everything to do with it i shall now add a little milk to make the mixture palatable and on presenting it to the dog we find that he laps it up readily enough as he spoke he turned the contents of the wine glass into a saucer and placed it in front of the terrier 
who speedily licked it dry sherlock holmes earnest demeanour had so far convinced us that we all sat in silence watching the animal intently and expecting some startling effect none such appeared however the dog continued to lie stretched upon the cushion breathing in a laboured way but apparently neither the better nor the worse for its draught holmes had taken out his watch and as minute followed minute without result an expression of the utmost chagrin and disappointment appeared upon his features he gnawed his lip drummed his fingers upon the table and showed every other symptom of acute impatience so great was his emotion that i felt sincerely sorry for him while the two detectives smiled derisively by no means displeased at this check which he had met it can't be a coincidence he cried at last springing from his chair and pacing wildly up and down the room it is impossible that it should be a mere coincidence the very pills which i suspected in the case of drebber are actually found after the death of stangerson and yet they are inert what can it mean surely my whole chain of reasoning cannot have been false it is impossible and yet this wretched dog is none the worse ah i have it i have it with a perfect shriek of delight he rushed to the box cut the other pill in two dissolved it added milk and presented it to the terrier the unfortunate creature's tongue seemed hardly to have been moistened in it before it gave a convulsive shiver in every limb and lay as rigid and lifeless as if it had been struck by lightning sherlock holmes drew a long breath and wiped the perspiration from his forehead i should have more faith he said i ought to know by this time that when a fact appears to be opposed to a long train of deductions it invariably proves to be capable of bearing some other interpretation of the two pills in that box one was of the most deadly poison and the other was entirely harmless i ought to have known that before i ever saw the box at all this last statement appeared to me to be so startling that i could hardly believe that he was in his sober senses there was the dead dog however to prove that his conjectures had been correct it seemed to me that the mists in my own mind were gradually clearing away and i began to have a dim vague perception of the truth all this seems strange to you continued holmes because you failed at the beginning of the inquiry to grasp the importance of the single real clue which was presented to you i had the good fortune to seize upon that and everything which has occurred since then has served to confirm my original supposition and indeed was the logical sequence of it hence things which have perplexed you and made the case more obscure have served to enlighten me and to strengthen my conclusions it is a mistake to confound strangeness with mystery the most commonplace crime is often the most mysterious because it presents no new or special features from which deductions may be drawn this murder would have been infinitely more difficult to unravel had the body of the victim been simply found lying in the roadway without any of these outre and sensational accompaniments which have rendered it remarkable these strange details far from making the case more difficult have really had the effect of making it less so mr gregson who had listened to this address with considerable impatience could contain himself no longer look here mr sherlock holmes he said we're all ready to acknowledge that you are a smart man and you have your own methods of working we want something more more than theory and preaching now though it's a case of taking the man i have made my case out and it seems i was wrong young charpentier could not have been engaged in this second affair lestrade went after his man stangerson and it appears that he was wrong too you've thrown out hints here and hints there and seem to know more than we do but the time has come when we feel that we have a right to ask you straight out how much you do know of the business can you name the man who did it oh, i cannot help feeling that gregson is right sir remarked lestrade we have both tried and we both failed you have remarked more than once since i've been in the room that you had all the evidence which you require surely you will not withhold it any longer 
any delay in arresting the assassin i observed might give him time to perpetrate some fresh atrocity thus pressed by us all holmes showed signs of irresolution he continued to walk up and down the room with his head sunk on his chest and his brows drawn down as was his habit when lost in thought there will be no more murders he said at last stopping abruptly and facing us you can put that consideration out of the question you have asked me if i know the name of the assassin i do the mere knowing of his name is a small thing however compared with the power of laying our hands upon him this i expect very shortly to do i have good hopes of managing it through my own arrangements but it is a thing which needs delicate handling for we have a shrewd and desperate man to deal with who is supported as i have had occasion to prove by another who is as clever as himself as long as this man has no idea that anyone can have a clue there is some chance of securing him but if he had the slightest suspicion he would change his name and vanish in an instant among the four million inhabitants of this great city without meaning to hurt either of your feelings i am bound to say that i consider these men to be more than a match for the official force and that is why i have not asked your assistance if i fail i shall of course incur all the blame due to this omission but that i am prepared for at present i am ready to promise that the instant that i can communicate with you without endangering my own combinations i shall do so gregson and lestrade seemed to be far from satisfied by this assurance or by the depreciating allusion to the detective police the former had flushed up to the roots of his flaxen hair while the other's beady eyes glistened with curiosity and resentment neither of them had time to speak however before there was a tap at the door and the spokesman of the street arabs young wiggins introduced his insignificant and unsavoury person please sir he said touching his forelock i have the cab downstairs good boy said holmes blandly why don't you introduce this pattern at scotland yard he continued taking a pair of steel handcuffs from a drawer see how beautifully the spring works they fasten in an instant the old pattern is good enough remarked lestrade if we can only find the man to put them on very good very good said holmes smiling the cabman may as well help me with my boxes just ask him to step up wiggins i was surprised to find my companion speaking as though he were about to set out on a journey since he had not said anything to me about it there was a small portmanteau in the room and this he pulled out and began to strap he was busily engaged at it when the cabman entered the room just give me a help with this buckle cabman he said kneeling over his task and never turning his head the fellow came forward with a somewhat sullen defiant air and put down his hands to assist at that instant there was a sharp click the jangling of metal and sherlock holmes sprang to his feet again gentlemen he cried with flashing eyes let me introduce you to mr jefferson hope the murderer of enoch drebber and of joseph stangerson the whole thing occurred in a moment so quickly that i had no time to realize it i have a vivid recollection of that instant of holmes's triumphant expression and the ring of his voice of the cabman's dazed savage face as he glared at the glittering handcuffs which had appeared as if by magic upon his wrists for a second or two we might have been a group of statues then with an inarticulate roar of fury the prisoner wrenched himself free from holmes's grasp and hurled himself through the window woodwork and glass gave way before him but before he got quite through gregson lestrade and holmes sprang upon him like so many staghounds he was dragged back into the room and then commenced a terrific conflict so powerful and so fierce was he that the four of us were shaken off again and again he appeared to have the convulsive strength of a man in an epileptic fit his face and hands were terribly mangled by his passage through the glass but loss of blood had no effect in diminishing his resistance it was not until lestrade succeeded in getting his hand inside his neckcloth and half strangling him that we made him realize that his struggles were of no avail 
and even then we felt no security until we had pinioned his feet as well as his hands that done we rose to our feet breathless and panting we have his cab said sherlock holmes it will serve to take him to scotland yard and now gentlemen he continued with a pleasant smile we have reached the end of our little mystery you are very welcome to put any questions that you like to me now and there is no danger that i will refuse to answer them end of chapter seven and part one part two the country of the saints chapter one on the great alkali plain in the central portion of the great north american continent there lies an arid and repulsive desert which for many a long year served as a barrier against the advance of civilization from the sierra nevada to nebraska and from the yellowstone river in the north to the colorado upon the south is a region of desolation and silence nor is nature always in one mood throughout this grim district it comprises snow-capped and lofty mountains and dark and gloomy valleys there are swift flowing rivers which dash through jagged canyons and there are enormous plains which in winter are white with snow and in summer are gray with the saline alkali dust they all preserve however the common characteristics of barrenness inhospitality and misery there are no inhabitants of this land of despair a band of pawnees or of blackfeet may occasionally traverse it in order to reach other hunting grounds but the hardiest of the braves are glad to lose sight of those awesome plains and to find themselves once more upon their prairies the coyote skulks among the scrub the buzzard flaps heavily through the air and the clumsy grizzly bear lumbers through the dark ravines and picks up such sustenance as it can amongst the rocks these are the sole dwellers in the wilderness in the whole world there can be no more dreary view than that from the northern slope of the sierra blanco as far as the eye can reach stretches the great flat plainland all dusted over with patches of alkali and intersected by clumps of the dwarfish chaparral bushes on the extreme verge of the horizon lie a long chain of mountain peaks with their rugged summits flecked with snow in this great stretch of country there is no sign of life nor of anything appertaining to life there is no bird in the steel blue heaven no movement upon the dull gray earth above all there is absolute silence listen as one may there is no shadow of a sound in all that mighty wilderness nothing but silence complete and heart subduing silence it has been said there is nothing appertaining to life upon the broad plain that is hardly true looking down from the sierra blanco one sees a pathway traced out across the desert which winds away and is lost in the extreme distance it is rutted with wheels and trodden down by the feet of many adventurers here and there there are scattered white objects which glisten in the sun and stand out against the dull deposit of alkali approach and examine them they are bones some large and coarse others smaller and more delicate the former have belonged to oxen and the latter to men for fifteen hundred miles one may trace this ghastly caravan route by these scattered remains of those who had fallen by the wayside looking down on this very scene there stood upon the fourth of may eighteen hundred and forty seven a solitary traveller his appearance was such that he might have been the very genius or demon of the region an observer would have found it difficult to say whether he was nearer to forty or to sixty his face was lean and haggard and the brown parchment like skin was drawn tightly over the projecting bones his long brown hair and beard were all flecked and dashed with white his eyes were sunken in his head and burned with an unnatural luster while the hand which grasped his rifle was hardly more fleshy than that of a skeleton as he stood he leaned upon his weapon for support and yet his tall figure 
and the massive framework of his bones suggested a wiry and vigorous constitution his gaunt face however and his clothes which hung so baggily over his shriveled limbs proclaimed what it was that gave him that senile and decrepit appearance the man was dying dying from hunger and from thirst he had toiled painfully down the ravine and on to this little elevation in the vain hope of seeing some signs of water now the great salt plain stretched before his eyes and the distant belt of savage mountains without a sign anywhere of plant or tree which might indicate the presence of moisture in all that broad landscape there was no gleam of hope north and east and west he looked with wild questioning eyes and then he realized that his wanderings had come to an end and that there on that barren crag he was about to die why not here as well as in a feather bed twenty years hence he muttered as he seated himself in the shelter of a boulder before sitting down he had deposited upon the ground his useless rifle and also a large bundle tied up in a gray shawl which he had carried slung over his right shoulder it appeared to be somewhat too heavy for his strength for in lowering it it came down the ground with some little violence instantly there broke from the gray parcel a little moaning cry and from it protruded a small scared face with very bright brown eyes and two little speckled dimpled fists you've hurt me said a childish voice reproachfully have i though the man answered penitently i didn't go for to do it as he spoke he unwrapped the gray shawl and extricated a pretty little girl of about five years of age whose dainty shoes and smart pink frock with its little linen apron all bespoke a mother's care the child was pale and wan but her healthy arms and legs showed that she had suffered less than her companion how is it now he answered anxiously for she was still rubbing the towsy golden curls which covered the back of her head kiss it and make it well she said with perfect gravity shoving the injured part up to him that's what mother used to do where's mother mother's gone i guess you'll see her before long gone eh said the little girl funny she didn't say good-bye she most always did if she was just going over to auntie's for tea and now she's been away three days say it's awful dry ain't it ain't there no water nor nothing to eat no there ain't nothing dearie you'll just need to be patient a while and then you'll be all right put your head up begin me like that again and you'll feel bullier it ain't easy to talk when your lips is like leather but i guess i'd best let you know how the cards lie what's that you got pretty things fine things cried the little girl enthusiastically holding up two glittering fragments of mica when we goes back to home i'll give them to my brother bob you'll see prettier things than them soon said the man confidently you just wait a bit i was going to tell you though you remember when we left the river oh yes well we reckon we'd strike another river soon you see but there was something wrong compasses or map or something and it didn't turn up water ran out just except a little drop for the likes of you and 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 you couldn't wash yourself interrupted his companion gravely staring up at his grimy visage no nor drink and mr bender he was the first to go and then indian pete and then mrs mcgregor and then johnny hones and then dearie your mother then mother's a deader too cried the little girl dropping her face in her pinafore and sobbing bitterly yes they all went except you and me then i thought there was some chance of water in this direction so i heaved you over my shoulder and we tramped it together it don't seem as though we've improved matters there's an almighty small chance for us now do you mean that we're going to die too 
asked the child, checking her sobs and raising her tear-stained face. "'I guess that's about the size of it.' "'Why didn't you say so before?' she said, laughing gleefully. "'You gave me such a fright. Why, of course, now as long as we die we'll be with mother again.' 